Every 90 minutes, astronauts on the International Space Station witness a sunrise. Then, 45 minutes later, a sunset. In a single Earth day, they experience 16 complete day-night cycles while hurtling through space at 17,500 miles per hour. Without gravity's familiar pull or nature's rhythms to anchor them, how do six people maintain their sanity and their bodies in a metal tube 250 miles above Earth for half a year straight? We'll walk through their engineered daily routines, from sleeping strapped to walls and using vacuum toilets, to mandatory workouts that keep bones from crumbling and care packages that preserve humanity. This is survival in space, where yesterday's urine becomes tomorrow's coffee and looking out the window might be the only thing keeping you sane. Time aboard the ISS doesn't exist the way we understand it. Mission controllers in Houston manufacture it, breaking each 24-hour period into five-minute blocks that dictate when astronauts wake, work, eat, exercise, and sleep. The official schedule runs from 6 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time, a 16-hour workday that would exhaust most Earth-bound workers. This rigid framework isn't bureaucratic overkill. Without it, the human body rebels against the constant light-dark cycling. Early space missions discovered that crews operating on loose schedules quickly develop severe sleep disorders and performance degradation. The brain needs predictable patterns to regulate hormones, maintain cognitive function, and process the day's experiences during sleep. Ground teams called ops planners choreograph these schedules months in advance, accounting for everything from spacewalk preparations to toilet maintenance windows. Each crew member receives a personalized timeline accounting for their specific experiments, maintenance duties, and even their circadian tendencies, whether they're naturally morning people or night owls. The schedule includes deliberate downtime and full weekends off. Lessons learned from decades of space psychology research, Soviet cosmonauts in the 1970s worked continuously for weeks, leading to exhaustion-related errors and interpersonal conflicts that nearly compromised missions. Modern planners understand that scheduled rest isn't weakness, it's operational necessity. Even with this manufactured routine, astronauts remain on call 24 hours a day. A carbon dioxide scrubber failure at 3 a.m. means everyone responds immediately. The schedule provides structure, but space itself sets the real priorities. Astronauts wake in personal crew quarters roughly the size of a phone booth, just large enough to float in without touching the walls. Their sleeping bag hangs secured to one wall, preventing them from drifting through the station while unconscious. Despite scheduling eight hours for sleep, most astronauts manage only six, kept awake by the station's constant mechanical humming and the surreal knowledge of where they are. The quarters feature acoustic padding to dampen the omnipresent fan noise, individual ventilation systems to prevent carbon dioxide pockets from forming around their faces while sleeping, and laptop mounts for evening entertainment. This tiny space represents their only privacy for six months, a psychological necessity discovered through hard experience on earlier stations where cosmonauts slept in common areas. Morning hygiene eliminates everything familiar about getting ready for the day. Showers don't exist because water droplets would float everywhere, potentially shorting electrical systems or being inhaled. Instead, astronauts use wet wipes and no-rinse shampoo originally developed for hospital patients who couldn't bathe. The shampoo contains mild surfactants that bind to oils and dirt, which astronauts then towel away along with the cleaning agents. Brushing teeth requires careful technique. Astronauts use regular toothpaste but minimal amounts, and most swallow it afterward rather than risk spitting into the station's atmosphere. Some use edible toothpaste designed for the station. Every glob of expelled toothpaste becomes a floating hazard that could damage equipment or end up in someone's eye or lungs. The seemingly simple act of washing hands involves a complex pouch system with minimal water, soap solution, and towels, all carefully contained to prevent droplets from escaping. NASA allocates about one gallon of water per crew member per day for all hygiene needs compared to the 80 to 100 gallons typical Americans use daily. The space toilet, officially the waste and hygiene compartment, requires actual training before astronauts can use it safely. Located in the tranquility module, it looks deceptively normal until you notice the leg restraints and foot straps. 
These aren't optional comfort features. They're essential to create the seal necessary for the vacuum system to function. The toilet operates on airflow rather than water, using differential air pressure to pull waste away from the body into collection systems. Solid waste gets compacted and stored in containers that return to Earth or burn up during atmospheric re-entry in cargo ships. Liquid waste undergoes a different journey, one that leads directly back to the crew. Users must position themselves precisely over a opening just four inches in diameter, much smaller than terrestrial toilets. Improper alignment or seal breaks can result in waste escaping into the cabin, a scenario that's both deeply unpleasant and genuinely dangerous in microgravity where contamination can't simply fall to the floor. The system includes a privacy curtain and its own ventilation system that creates airflow to help direct waste into the proper containers. This airflow also helps control odors, pulling them through filters before the air returns to the cabin. The fans creating this suction run constantly, adding to the station's background noise. Breakfast arrives in pouches and packets, the result of planning that began eight to nine months before launch. NASA nutritionists and astronauts collaborate to create personalized menu rotations that meet strict nutritional requirements adjusted for space, reduce sodium to protect bones losing density, reduced iron since red blood cell production decreases, and increased vitamin D to compensate for zero sun exposure. The galley occupies minimal space, roughly equivalent to an airplane's compact lavatory. It contains a water dispenser for rehydrating foods and a conduction oven for warming meals, but no refrigerator or freezer. Everything must remain shelf-stable for months, limiting fresh options to the first few days after resupply missions arrive. Food comes in three primary forms. Thermostabilized meals arrive in pouches, already cooked and ready to heat. Military MREs refined for space. Rehydratable foods save precious cargo weight by removing water on Earth. Astronauts add it back using the galley's dispenser, which provides both ambient and heated water. The third category includes natural form foods like nuts, dried fruits, and specially packaged crackers that need no preparation. The water for rehydration comes from an unexpected source. The station's sophisticated recycling system that processes humidity from breath and sweat, plus yesterday's urine. The environmental control and life support system employs vacuum distillation with centrifuges to separate water from waste, then runs it through filters and high-temperature catalytic reactors until it exceeds terrestrial drinking water standards. Meals float if not secured, so astronauts use magnetized trays and utensils with Velcro strips holding packets in place. They must eat carefully. Crumbs don't fall harmlessly to the floor, but drift through the cabin, potentially damaging equipment or being inhaled. Tortillas replaced bread for this reason, and salt and pepper come as liquids to prevent seasoning particles from floating away. The psychological importance of food variety led NASA to include comfort foods and cultural dishes reflecting the international crew. Russian, Japanese, European, and American foods rotate through the menu. Special occasion meals for holidays and birthdays provide crucial morale boosts during the long isolation. Two hours of exercise isn't a suggestion or a wellness initiative. It's a medical prescription preventing physical deterioration that would otherwise cripple astronauts within weeks. Without gravity's constant load, bones lose density at 1-2% to 2 per month, particularly in the spine, hips, and legs. Muscles atrophy even faster, losing mass and strength within days of arriving in orbit. The Advanced Resistive Exercise Device anchors this countermeasure program. Using vacuum cylinders and flywheels instead of traditional weights, ARED provides up to 600 pounds of resistance for squats, deadlifts, and bench presses. Astronauts strap themselves to the machine to prevent floating away mid-rep, turning every exercise into a full-body coordination challenge. The T2 treadmill, named Colbert after comedian Stephen Colbert, requires a harness system that provides downward force simulating body weight. Without this loading, running would simply push astronauts toward the ceiling. The harness starts at about 60% of Earth body weight and gradually increases as astronauts adapt. Vibration isolation systems prevent the treadmill's impacts from shaking the entire station and disrupting delicate experiments. The cycle ergometer with vibration isolation and stabilization system provides cardiovascular training without the jarring impacts of running. 
Astronauts clip their feet to pedals and can adjust resistance to maintain target heart rates. Some use it for virtual races with cyclists on Earth, maintaining competitive motivation across the void. Exercise equipment placement reflects careful planning. The devices occupy prime real estate near windows, allowing astronauts to watch Earth roll by during workouts, a psychological boost during the physical discomfort. The equipment also serves double duty as medical assessment tools with built-in sensors tracking performance metrics that doctors on Earth monitor for signs of deconditioning. Despite this rigorous program, astronauts still lose bone and muscle mass. They return to Earth requiring weeks or months of rehabilitation to recover full strength. Current research focuses on more efficient exercise protocols and pharmaceutical supplements to better preserve human physiology during future Mars missions, where rehabilitation facilities won't exist. Personal time happens behind a thin fabric curtain in quarters barely large enough to turn around in. This space, roughly two cubic meters, provides the only solitude available for six months. Astronauts describe it as simultaneously claustrophobic and essential, a psychological pressure valve in an environment where someone is always within arm's reach. The quarters contain personal items limited to what fit in a 5 kilogram allocation and per crew member. Family photos velcro to the walls. Letters from children get read and re-read. A favorite book or small musical instrument might make the cut. These objects anchor astronauts to their Earth identities when everything else about existence has changed. Sound pervades everything. The station runs on fans, hundreds of them, circulating air, cooling equipment, and running life support. Veterans compare it to living inside a giant vacuum cleaner or server room. New arrivals often can't sleep without earplugs, but most eventually adapt, finding the mechanical drone reassuring proof that systems are functioning. The constant noise creates an unexpected privacy benefit. Conversations don't carry far through the mechanical din. Astronauts can video call family from their quarters with reasonable confidence that crewmates won't overhear intimate discussions. These calls home become lifelines, scheduled weeks in advance and protected as sacred time. Internet access exists but runs through NASA servers with significant delays and restrictions. Email gets screened for security. Social media posts require approval. Bandwidth limitations mean no streaming services or large downloads. Astronauts describe the connection as reminiscent of 1990s dial-up. Functional, but frustrating. During off hours, crew members gather in the Unity module or the windowed cupola for group activities. Movie nights using a projector and laptop become major social events. Card games, particularly cribbage, maintain a decades-old tradition from submarine crews who face similar isolation. Some astronauts learn musical instruments, practicing in their quarters with headphones to avoid disturbing others. The Russian segment maintains different cultural approaches to downtime, including a small table where cosmonauts share tea and conversation, a ritual predating the ISS on Soviet stations. These cultural distinctions provide variety in the social environment, preventing the monotony that plagued single-nation missions. The cupola's seven windows offer the station's most powerful psychological medicine. Astronauts universally report that Earth-gazing never gets old, even after months in orbit. They watch storms develop, cities light up at night, and aurora dance across the poles. This view, impossible to capture fully in photographs, reminds them why they're there and what they're protecting. Window time gets scheduled like any other resource, but crews develop informal sharing systems. Someone working in the cupola during a particularly spectacular pass over the Himalayas will call others to come look. These moments of collective awe break the mechanical routine and rebuild team cohesion worn down by months of proximity stress. Care packages arrive with each resupply mission, limited to five kilograms per crew member, and screened meticulously for hazards. No alcohol which becomes explosive in the oxygen-rich environment. No bread or cookies that might crumble. No pressurized containers that could rupture. Within these constraints, mission support teams and families get creative. Fresh fruit arriving on resupply vehicles triggers celebration. Apples, oranges, and occasionally more exotic fruits get shared ceremonially, savored over days before radiation and the lack of refrigeration take their toll. The smell of fresh orange peel can make astronauts cry. So powerful is the sensory connection to Earth. The permission to grow beards represents a small but significant autonomy in an environment where most personal choices vanish. 
Unlike other military environments, facial hair doesn't compromise equipment function, so astronauts can express individuality through appearance. Some grow space beards they'd never attempt on Earth, documenting the progression in photos. Birthdays and holidays get celebrated with whatever resources are available. Crews have fashioned Christmas trees from food packets and perform zero-gravity concerts. A Japanese astronaut once conducted a tea ceremony in orbit, adapting ancient rituals to weightlessness. Saturday morning, video calls home become anchoring rituals. Astronauts read bedtime stories to their children, participate virtually in family dinners, and watch their babies take first steps on screens. The 1.3 second communication delay creates awkward pauses, but families adapt, learning to speak in longer, complete thoughts rather than quick exchanges. Common misconceptions about space life often miss the mundane realities that define daily existence. The idea that astronauts float in zero gravity is technically wrong. They're in constant freefall, perpetually falling around Earth at 17,500 miles per hour. Gravity at the ISS altitude is still 90% of Earth's surface strength. The sensation of weightlessness comes from the orbital motion, not gravity's absence. The sun appears brilliant white from space, not yellow as we see it through Earth's atmosphere. Its unfiltered radiation requires special window coatings and strict exposure limits to prevent cataracts and cancer. Astronauts describe the sun as painfully bright, requiring them to work with backs turned during certain orbital positions. Nobody would explode in space vacuum as Hollywood suggests. The human body is remarkably resilient to pressure changes. An unprotected person would have perhaps 15 seconds of useful consciousness before blood oxygen depletion causes blackout, with death from asphyxiation following within two minutes. The lungs would empty, saliva would boil on the tongue, but the skin would hold everything together. Asteroid fields aren't the dense navigation hazards depicted in films. Rocks typically separate by thousands of miles, making collisions astronomically unlikely. The real space debris danger comes from human-made objects, paint flecks traveling at rifle bullet speeds that require the station to occasionally adjust orbit for avoidance. The station itself isn't silent, as movies suggest. Beyond the constant fan noise, it creaks and pops as thermal expansion from sunlight causes metal to flex. Pumps gurgle. Compressors cycle. Astronauts describe a constant symphony of mechanical sounds that becomes oddly comforting. Silence would mean system failure. Spacewalks aren't the graceful ballet often portrayed. The spacesuits are pressurized, rigid balloons that fight every movement. Astronauts train for months to perform simple tasks like turning bolts, and their forearms burn from constantly fighting the suit's resistance. A six-hour spacewalk leaves astronauts exhausted, with bloodied knuckles and bruised shoulders from the suit's hard contact points. Growing food in space remains largely experimental. Despite optimistic reports, the station has produced small quantities of lettuce and radishes, but these supplement rather than supply nutrition. The water, energy, and crew time required for space agriculture currently exceeds the caloric return, though research continues for future Mars missions where resupply won't exist. The most persistent myth might be that astronauts are fearless adventurers who never struggle with the psychological challenges. In reality, every astronaut reports moments of profound homesickness, frustration with crewmates, and anxiety about equipment failures. The difference isn't the absence of these feelings, but the training and support systems that help process them productively. After six months of manufactured days and nights, sleeping in a bag velcroed to a wall, and turning yesterday's urine into tomorrow's coffee, astronauts return to Earth fundamentally changed. They've learned that human survival in space isn't about conquering a hostile environment. It's about accepting absolute dependence on technology, schedules, and each other. Every breath comes from machines. Every meal was planned nearly a year ago. Every moment of privacy happens behind a curtain in a closet-sized space. Yet astronauts consistently describe their missions as the pinnacle of their lives. Not because living in space is comfortable or glorious, but because it strips existence down to its engineering essentials. Maintaining life support, completing objectives, and finding meaning in the work. They return with a visceral understanding that Earth itself is just a larger spacecraft, its life support systems more forgiving but equally finite.